Let's get started. Thanks everyone for joining us for today's Strengthening Families webinar. We are talking today about early relational health and the protective factors and very excited to hear from Dr. David Willis and then to hear from all of you about your thoughts about how this new exciting work connects to our mm -hmm. ongoing work on strengthening families. So a little bit about Zoom webinars that we're in. Um, as a participant, you come in automatically muted, but you can raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted, if you've got something to say, and we'll do that um, when we get to the Q&A session at the end. You can also type into the Q&A um, where we will be able to answer your question and others will be able to see your question and the response to it as well. Um, and you can type in the chat if you're having issues with audio or something like that, um, that you want to ask for help from those of us who are on this side of the webinar. We'll be happy to help you as much as we can. And uh, hopefully we won't have too much of that, but we are here to help you figure it out. One piece of advice that is always true is if you're having trouble with the audio, if you're connected to the computer audio, switch to your phone. If you're connected to the phone audio, switch to the computer. That's the magic uh, trick that sometimes works and is always worth trying. But if you're having problems beyond that, please let us know. All right, a little bit about our Strengthening Families webinars. Um, this is an open invitation. We do it every month and anyone is welcome to join us who's using the Protective Factors Framework in your work, whatever that may look like. We jointly convene these between my organization, the Center for the Study of Social Policy and the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. Each month we coordinate a topic, guest speakers. Um, sometimes it's more of a discussion, sometimes more of a presentation. We like to mix it up and we always welcome volunteers and suggestions. So let me know if you have ideas uh, or if you have work you'd like to share on a future webinar. Also important to note that we always record these webinars and the Alliance posts the recording as well as the slides and any handouts on the Google site that you see listed here. And you can always find that link in the emails that go out about the webinars, um, including the follow-up email that you'll get after today. So um, those will be posted within a couple of days, uh, as well as the recording being available through Zoom. But it is nice to have the slides as well, and those get posted separately on that Google site. So as I said, we do this each month, always on the second Thursday at this time. And so on July 9th, we will be applying CSSP's anti-racist intersectional frame to our work. I'm gonna say a little bit more about that uh, before we get into the meat of today's um, agenda. But um, just so you know, that will be our July 9th webinar. We'll be talking about the anti-racist intersectional frame that we use at CSSP and how others can use it um, in your own work and how it can be applied to strengthening families, family support, early childhood work. So mark your calendar for that. If you're interested, you can register now or you can wait until you see um, <clears throat> the official announcement come out in our uh, newsletters. All right, so our official agenda for today, I'll be sharing a few updates from CSSP and then Martha Reeder will share some updates from the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. And then we'll get into our main topic, which is early relational health and the protective factors with David Willis. So I should have introduced myself at the beginning. I'm Kaylin O'Connor from CSSP. Mm. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging what's been going on in our world. So thanking you all for taking the time to join us today, even though um, I know for many of us, this has been a really hard time to focus um, on our work, uh, which while we believe we're advancing <laughs> good outcomes for all children and families, it can feel like it's not enough and it's not um, immediate enough to respond to the crisis that our country is in. And so I um, just wanted to take a moment to share, um, if you haven't seen it, CSSP put out a statement um, about Black Lives Matter and our support of that movement and our um, commitment to advancing uh, an anti-racist agenda. And I also wanted to share, because I know that many of you are also um, grappling with this in your own work and in your personal lives, some tools that we have available. And as I said, our July webinar will go into more of this. We do have an anti-racist intersectional frame that is available on our website. And we have a glossary of key terms around racial equity work, actually around equity work in general, not just racial equity. And so uh, please feel free to peruse our website, use those tools if they're helpful. 
and uh, join our conversation on July 9th because we'll be going through what all of that is, um, sharing CSSP's perspective on this work, which we've been engaged in for a long time, but we still haven't perfected. <laughs> and um, looking forward to hearing what all of you want to share as well. Just a couple other updates from CSSP today. Um, we've uh, well, I wrote a guest blog that was published yesterday for the Healthy Outcomes from Positive Experiences Project, or HOPE, uh, about how the HOPE project and the research on positive childhood experiences really helps to fill in the science behind protective factors. And so I encourage you to read that and share it if you find it helpful. It's on the hopepositiveexperience.org website, um, and I believe it will be cross-posted on CSSP's website as well. We also have two new tools, uh, relatively new. We announced them last month that came out uh, in response to the COVID crisis. Um, one is for parents called Building Resilience in Troubled Times, um, really talking about resilience and then how the other protective factors relate to it. So I encourage you, I know many of you have already accessed that and have been using it, which is great to hear, um, but wanted to share it today as well. And a companion piece to that uh, for providers is called strength-based practice in troubled times, um, really helping providers to think about how they can stay focused on strengths when they're dealing with a lot of families in crisis and perhaps having shorter interactions with parents um, that are, you know, not the same kind of work they usually do. So um, please access that and share it with others if you think it would be useful. Um, if you're looking for those tools and CSSP's other uh, work and resources related to the COVID-19 response, you can find them at our COVID-19 Clearinghouse. And actually, the easiest thing would be just to go to CSSP.org and click on the COVID-19 Clearinghouse that is part of the scrolling feature at the top of the website. I'm not sure what that's called, but <laughs> it moves through and <laughs> you can find it there. Um, or type in this Our Work Project COVID-19. Also wanted to make sure that everyone knows we are co-hosts of the uh, Together for Families Conference, which is going to be held virtually this fall, October 14th through 16th. We really encourage you to put that on your calendar. Registration will be opening soon. We know that some folks, uh, particularly in state government agencies, um, have funds that need to be spent by June 30th. So we wanna help you with that. If you need help, <laughs> uh, we will get that registration open soon. So keep an eye on your email for an announcement about that and mark those dates on your calendar. Uh, we are learning a lot about what virtual conferences can look like, what the possibilities are, um, how to do it well and keep it engaging and give you chances to network with each other. Some of the things that we all get out of going to conferences in person, we're trying to replicate as much of that as we can. I should say we co-host that with the National Family Support Network and Be Strong Families and Families Canada. So we will have some uh, Canadian partners joining us and uh, doing some sessions that sort of compare so we can learn about systems in each other's countries and how we support families. All right, I'm gonna hand off to my colleague, Martha Reeder to share some updates from the Alliance. Hello everyone, it's good to be with you this afternoon. Um, I, we can go to the next slide if you like. Um, so one of the things that has um, struck me as we have been working through the COVID crisis and through all the, um, the uh, social injustice issues that we've been dealing with in the past few weeks and for a long time actually, um, is that what is happening in our world of the work world that we're in is that so many of the organizations we work with are producing some wonderful resources and Kaylin just shared uh, some of those that CSSP has has uh, created and uh, the Alliance has been doing some of the same kinds of things and uh, a lot of our partner organizations have so it just really is a testament to um, how hard we know all of you work and we're, we're doing our best to support you in any way that we can. Um, as we all began hearing about COVID-19 after the beginning of 2020, um, conversations with the parent groups that the Alliance work, 
uh, works with begins to bubble up. And so late in February, <clears throat> I met with the Alliance National Parent Partnership Council, and we decided to begin the process of thinking um, what might be an encouragement to families as, um, as we face the realities of a global pandemic. So over the next month, um, as we, during the month of February and March, um, after we had a series of very intense meetings and the tool that you see here was created uh, by parents and for parents and the communities in which they live. Um, this was primarily the members of the Alliance National Parent Partnership Council, but we also invited some of our partners from the Birth Parent National Network. And um, in this tool, there's a question for each one of the everyday actions for all five protective factors. And these questions are designed to help those in the conversation to recognize and to acknowledge ways in which the protective factors they already have built in their lives can uh, strengthen them and the communities they live in during this time. So um, it really is a conversation tool. Um, it's based on the everyday actions. It has a facilitator guide. It has participant worksheets, the PowerPoint if, if you're conversations are virtual and you would like to use it that way. And then there's also a way to report back what happens in those conversations so that we can convene all that together, aggregate all that together and um, help move that national conversation along. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, I think if you look in your chat box, you'll see a link to the page on our website where you can find those tools. So um, in addition to that, um, uh, that tool is available in English and also in Spanish. We have also been sharing so many of the resources that some of your organizations have shared and others that we have um, found that would be helpful, especially re related to strengthening families and parenting through an ongoing social media campaign that is part of our um, Alliance National Parent Partnership Council's work. So these are things that, that our parents say, this is useful to me and we wanna share it out with other parents. And so I encourage you to go and take a look at that social media campaign and share those with people that you think that it would be helpful to. Um, the Alliance is also um, hosting a, a conversation every week with our uh, parent organizations, the Birth Parent National Network, the Bir Birth and Foster Parent Partnership, and the Birth Parent Advisory Council, where we are connecting with parents on these issues and just having conversations to support them through this time. Um, I would also encourage you to go to the public policy page on our website and uh, where we have critical and timely information. There's so many policy issues emerging right now and we want you to be an active part of that. So please sign up for the Alliance Action Alert list there and uh, you, will get, um, you will get good information um, from our public policy director, Jim McKay. So um, you can go to the next slide. So all of the conversations that we are involved in right now um, end up being virtual conversations. And sometimes we're not quite prepared for those. Um, it, it has been a real challenge uh, to, to move from, from the, the normal, everyday things that we're used to dealing with. You may have great resources, but you may not be able to use them exactly the way that you had in the past. And uh, so we, we have given uh, with, as far as all the resources that the Alliance provides, sort of a scan of how they might be used in a virtual conversation. So um, check that out. And also, uh, I don't wanna forget the uh, Alliance's online training around the five protective factors, which has recently been, um, we have updated it, refreshed it. It's now on the platform of Pro Solutions Training, and you can still take it for free, free of charge, but you can also pay a small fee and get CEUs or state childcare credit. And um, I want to say it's very uh, interactive. We've added some interactivity, we've added new information. Uh, that that will be really helpful and valuable. And um, we're also anticipating that in the next two months that it will be available in Spanish as well. 
So we already have the drafts done in Spanish. We're in the, we're in the process of uh, just kind of going through and making changes. So it, this, we're really close to having it ready in Spanish. And that's all I have today, Kaylin. Thank you so much, Martha. All right, I'm going to hand over the screen and the microphone to David Willis, uh, who is a pediatrician, who's a senior fellow at CSSP and has been leading this body of work around early relational health and uh, has recently reached some milestones with that work. And we're excited to share it all with you. So David, welcome. Oh, hold on. Unmute me. I did unmute you, sorry about that. All right, we're good. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Um, I'm thankful to be with you this afternoon and to talk with you about early relational health and especially um, how it directly relates to our strengthening families and protective factors work. It's really exciting to, to, to bring together um, the, your strength, your commitments and your energies to think with us about the criticalness of early relationships. And my learn, our learning objectives for today are to talk about the mindset of focusing on foundational relationships, which are really essential for promotion and prevention activities. Um, to think and to share with you some of the knowledge we have of evidence-based practices that advance early relational health in child health care transformation and place-based work, and to um, engage with you about reflecting on the importance of foundational relationships within the Strengthening Families framework. Um, although this is not me with my sons many years ago, it does though remind me um, so much about the what we've learned over um, some the recent decades about the criticalness of the early period. And a baby's future starts immediately in the relationship experiences that go on around them. That's been my passion and my interest about how do what you build a healthy brain and mind of every baby and for future social, educational, and um, health success. It starts so very young and it's deeply relational and the science is really guiding us to know ever further about that effort. And we, over the last decades, know that we talk about child development occurring within the environment of relationships. And we, a number of us have been focused about, so what does that mean and how do we get deeper into the promotion of strong relationships in terms of improving um, um, the importance of outcomes. But as you know, our children are not doing well in our nation, it's even before COVID and ever more under the stress now. Um, throughout my career, I've been um, stunned by the number of children that come to school not ready, and especially in the social emotional domain. As I am an infant mental health specialist in pediatric clothing, I also think a lot about preventative mental health and knowing that the early relationship experiences of safety, positive promotion and intentionality build well-being and how do we bring that effort ever more to all families and to um, the earliest years. So um, that's what we wanna talk about today is what we're learning about the early relational health work. But I'm not tone deaf to the challenges that are happening every day as a result of the COVID um, experience and you may, be aware of this work um, of our colleagues, Phil Fisher, Joan Lombardi, and uh, Nat Kendall-Taylor from Frameworks that has actually created a, a, a weekly survey process of parents' experiences in this moment in time and are posting that material on their website, which is um, Rapid EC Project. And, and strikingly, um, last week, um, 48% of caregivers of this large survey cross nation um, are struggling with household economic um, security. Um, with, we all know that two thirds of families are experiencing increasing stress and they would say too that they're seeing increasing social emotional challenges that this brings to their children. The relationship experiences and the experiences of families under this stress is critical to our strong effort and why the foundations that we have in strengthening families 
are central to thinking about supporting and um, um, providing protection for um, children and families in these communities. Yet I've also said in the middle of a crisis is a time to really foreshadow and be thinking about recovery redesign or building back better that sense of keeping our eye on how do we use this disruptive moment to move forward. And that becomes also the opportunity that I know you all share from a strengthening families perspective, how do we use this as our moment in time? And all of these elements are essential in this moment of um, supporting families, but also in terms of how do we foreshadow building protective factors and strengthening and moving ever more forward. And I want to propose to you that focusing relationally is ever more strongly. Um, I also am heartened that around all of our work and um, is discussions about how do we address the, the, the economic um, crisis that's in front of us. And you may be, keep your eye on the ball of dialogues that are going on um, even within Congress about a sense of, um, if not um, um, universal basic income as a strategy, or at least um, expanding what we've already done to try to create some emergency basic income supports. That effort on one thinks about how income support to young families has dramatic impacts is in the dialogue. As is now what we're challenged with in terms of the the social justice issue, but also the opportunity it gives to really change the social justice environment and the with an anti-racist perspective and challenge and, and, and the opportunity that is dramatic in front of us to bring about the change that we all have been long-term committed to. And that continues to be foreshadowed. The other thing that we've been learning, and you may have witnessed in the last year, some of the work that's been coming out about the beyond ACEs is the sense of protections that come from positive childhood experiences. There's an increasing view that one cannot talk about adversity without also talking about the positive experiences and relationships around people. And um, some of the work in the last year that Christy Bethel and Bob Sege have made more visible shows that in face of adversity, um, positive childhood experiences can have a protective effect. And we've all known that in the center of the Strengthening Families um, um, framework, but ever more, how do we double down on strengthening the positive experiences and positive relationships in front of us? The sense of moving from ACEs to hope that health outcomes of positive experiences, which are big, significant. Kalen's blog yesterday, speaks to that within our Strengthening Families frame. And Bob Sege, Kay Johnson, and I have likewise been trying to elevate this kind of thinking into the health sector to keep pushing on the criticalness of strengthening and supporting relationships. We are well backed up by um, growing scientific um, uh, knowledge that has been increasingly visible from the, national, from the Harvard work, from CDC, from the World Health Organization, from the National Academy of Sciences, and the by futures that really are call out the scientific base as to the criticalness of nurturing positive and safe environments and relationships to build human potential. So we're in a good space. And the importance of thinking about um, that foundational relationships, those that happen the earliest, build future capacities and that healthy outcomes from positive experience actually provide a common language beyond diversity. And within that is the sense that early relational health actually describes the positive nurturing relationships that advance physical health and development, social well-being, and resiliency. That sense of that we can balance ACEs with hope, which is actually a paradigm shift, all compatible with our strengthening families perspective um, which is strength-based, family-centric, relationally-centric, and the like. So I want to talk about early relationship, uh, early relational health, and call out that those of us in mental health know that it's relationships that are healing and protective 
and we're trying to harness that energy in terms of our knowledge. It is, early, early relational health is not a new field. It is perhaps to some of you a new term, but it really captures the importance of promotion, prevention, and that continuum that builds on the knowledge base that has been built over decades from the field of infant mental health and the specialized interventions, but because of the degree of struggle of young children and families, and because of the, the necessity in a population health effort to focus universally to the promotion prevention strategies, um, we've called out early relational health as an effort to galvanize the health system and the public health system ever more from the principles that we know are well bounded in the field of infant early childhood mental health. I sometimes get asked, so what are we talking about? What does it look like? Let me show you a couple of videos that, um, um, are, that speak for themselves. Does that show? Yes, it's working. It's working. Nice. I'm sure all of you were smiling in that moment, knowing you were watching that moment of emotional connection and that sense of joy, positivity, and the dyadic dance that was visible and you all know that has developed together in a positive relational health sense. Similarly, oops, back one. And you may have remembered this. I'm going to pause for a second because you remember when this went viral, there were millions that watched on Saul on Twitter and it captured even into the national news cycle, the beauty of this interactive space. From a relational health standpoint of this toddler and father, you see complexity of the positive interaction and it's, and it's, and it's dyadic, it's turn taking, it's serve and return, it's pause and wait, it's shared, it's experienced together pre-verbally in that space that we would call an early relational health space. And these are observable. There are characteristics to be witnessed. And um, let's follow this for just a couple more minutes to share the joy of a relational health experience. They know the same stuff, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like go somewhere else with that, don't break here, you know what I'm saying? That's what I said. Like, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, what in the world? Don't do it here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That is a joyful pattern to watch. And when one witnesses relational health, you know it when you're seeing it. And both of the members of that relationship are experiencing the joy of that amazing um, moment in time. Relational health develops. It's observable. It is sequential. It develops over a sequence period of time that has skills that grow together between a caregiver and a child as the brain's developing and as the relationship develops over time from mutual attention, engagement, and responsiveness, of course, with positive affect. And then there becomes a pacing interaction, a initiation effort where a child initiates to have the interaction happen with parent, and before long it becomes imitative, so often first noted as that bye-bye, or then moves into the sense of patty cake and other observable interactive patterns, 
and ultimately increasingly into shared purpose and goals together. Those skills are sequential in all cultures. They are observable in a dyadic sense. They are measurable in a sense of seeing their sequence move forward. And that is in the domain of behavioral and of relational health. In addition, the science around this space is compelling in terms of the biobehavioral synchrony and the dyadic neurodevelopment that is increasingly being described in the child development, neuroscience, neurodevelopment, and mental health space. Um, it's astounding the complexity of how the a baby, infant, toddler's brain resonates um, with, the care, with the experiences around them that come from the relational experiences. And when one measures dyadically what's happening in the relationship of each member, everywhere from EEG, brain-to-brain um, -brain synchrony, to looking at endocrine patterns in the interaction that go on with, it, with young children and their parents, to looking at how heart rates couple in terms of developing the stress regulation systems of the autonomic nervous system in, a, in the dance of dyadic nerve development, in the sense of the observable behavioral synchrony that can be microdissected and seen um, 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 in, in all dyadic interactions. This is foundational to what's talked about as attachment, brain development, and building um, um, future skills stress regulation and, and abilities. So we're talking about a framework that's dyadic, two-generational, it's bi-directional in the sense of going, it is between um, care, caregivers and a child. It's foundational to equity, resiliency, recovery, protection. Outcomes include um, um, health, early learning, social emotional competence, it's science-based, strength-based, family-centric. It's not about one program. It's about an all-in approach, approach of multiple efforts that play, take place in communities and around families. It's not about teaching parenting, but actually about supporting the strengths that are inherent in all relational experiences. One might then say it's actually a paradigm shift for our early childhood. With our last year's work at CSSP and the support of Perigee, uh, fund. We've been, we actually conducted a national survey. Many of you may have contributed to that. Thank you. And we've um, had a working definition of early relational health, which seemed to be well understood um, by um, the over 600 people that, um, that filled out our survey. And we learned a lot from the survey that one, there's really strong and building interest in, a, in early relational health. There are many stakeholders that are eager to identify how to translate this work into actionable policy and practice change. There's clear recognition of the need for financing support and policies to promote this relational focus effort. And it was also clear that the term early relational health may have need to be broadened in the framing to communicate to the public beyond the health sector itself. And we are also clear, we learned that, that families have to be placed in the center and family leadership is really critical to really advance a, a strong anti-racist uh, relational health frame. There was a report that, um, was, that frameworks put out about the communication strategies. Um, this is the web, the, 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 a webinar of that release as well as this paper is available on our website. But the major findings in the, in the study were that it, when one talks about trying to understand a new concept, the framing of the way one talks about these ideas is essential. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And that's why we engage the Frameworks Institute to help us with that effort. The framing also facilitates change. When one has clear communication, that helps change um, public thinking in support of what we're trying to move forward. Communication must include a common strategy. What we need to do is to try to move together in terms of the alignment of messaging such that uh, the communication is clear about why all this matters. So we're really trying to move this relational, foundational relationship sense beyond simply the perspective of caring families 
and the family bubble to much broader senses of support and strengthening of relationships and the context of relationships um, for which all this happens. So when we talk, frameworks also pointed out to us that when we talk about early re why, why relationships matter, especially early relationship health, one has to emphasize that early means early. So when one says early childhood, most people hear preschool or an into school age. They don't tend to hear the sense of infants and toddlers. So one has to be explicit that when we talk about early relational health, we're talking about infant toddler relationships that really matter. They also called out that the public really resonated with the term foundational relationships, knowing that that fundamental relational experiences is critical to future well-being. It was also clear from their studies that when we talk about relational health or foundational relationships, we're talking about um, the bi-directional nature and the dyadic nature of the relationships with all caregivers. And even more importantly, that there's a joy and a gratification in that moment of the relationships. And at this time of COVID, thinking about those moment by moment relationship opportunities per day have power to be promoting strong relationships as well as giving those moment, those key moments in time to really counter some of the stress and the effort. For example, reading, you know, two times or three times a day in that moment of being together is very powerful and important for families. So when we talk about this space of early relationship health and early relationship health in action, there are already activities going on out there that actually support this effort. Um, when one talks about the Reach on a Read efforts, Reach on a Read is a program we're providing books, but focusing on strengthening the relationships to promote literacy, Reach on a Read is actually moving to a strategy that is relationally focused from, um, from birth. And the Reach on a Read network is in every state touches about a third of all children in Medicaid, and in some states ever further, if they're natural partners to advance a relational health frame. But there's also other efforts that are going on, not only to strengthen relationships around the primary care sector, but also home visiting as a strategy is directly focused on promoting early relationship work and the, the advanced high-performing medical home models of Healthy Steps and Project Dulce are by their nature relationally focused in their work of trying to support with families. I'm excited about the work um, of, of Reach on Read. In fact, our CSSP team is um, partnering with Reach on Read National as well as with um, some of the affiliates in some states to advance relational health framing. And they actually see this as a part of their future um, for longer term outcomes as they're within their strategic plan they're really calling out the promotion of foundational relationships through pediatric primary care, um, putting it and seeing that it ends up on pediatric training, incorporated into Bright Futures um, efforts, and also becoming a standard part of primary care pediatrics, trying to advance a relational focus in the child care health sector is moving forward as we speak. And we have some colleagues in Michigan that are actually using video feedback with families, providing the opportunity for families to come into a what they call a five with your baby clinic before a well child visit in order to make a movie to get positive feedback about how does one strengthen the relationship. And what's been amazing is 78% of families offered this with a call before their well child visit an FQHC are coming in because this is so meaningful to them which we think is really is striking. You may have also heard um, that there's effort going on to, pr to promote um, Martha Welsh's effort, the neuroscience program at Columbia, that's really focusing on ob the observational patterns of emotional connectedness, which are, as we saw in that first video, looking at the attraction and the interaction, the vocal communication, the vocal expressiveness, that reciprocity and sensitivity as being really striking as a part of emotional connectedness being strong. Our colleagues in child health system, 
child health practice transformation are embracing a relational health frame in their thinking of the future of child health transformation and in looking at establishing a culture of relational health as this work moves forward. So it's part of a movement in this effort. I would say to you that the science is clear. It's critical for us to focus on the babies and the people who care for them, but one has to be attentive, of course, to the context around which all of this occurs. So the systems work of supporting the, uh, the, all of the context within which families leave, the, not the least of which is um, those, the, the key elements um, and supports in, at times of need. And the family resiliency and parent resiliency really are central um, in the support around communities. We learned from our early relational health survey um, from the field as to the number of activities that were viewed as relationally health focused, not the least of which was within the home visiting space, but also the efforts around parent education that went, that, that went everywhere from the circle of security parenting work to the use of room, to incredible years, to of course the efforts about read, talk, and sing as universal promotion efforts that are relationally centric. But there's also programs that are really focusing similarly between Triple P, Mom Power, Nurturing Parent programs, effort within early care and education, Head Start, and the like. And then also the efforts of the universe of the medical home, which is a universal touch point for all families. So there's already a lot of work going forward, but we're willing to try to elevate more of this intentional focus at this moment in time. Um, and just this last hour before joining this webinar, we have through our EC Link community an actual learn an action learning lab of ten communities that are trying that are working on strategies within their community systems to advance a relational health frame across sector in terms that been ever more intentionally the discussion in this moment in time of COVID and this time of addressing social justice focusing ever more deeply on a relational frame is growing in ascendancy. My colleagues in um, Bridgeport have really building an all-in strategy like the, in, the, in the Bridgeport Basics, which is an, has been an effort as, uh, to, to create a, a, a cross-sector, um, public, private, formal, informal focus to build the well-being of three-year-olds, um, knowing that in Bridgeport, three quarters of young children come to Head Start by three already behind developmentally. So there's been an intentional community organizing effort um, to, to, to focus relationally across all sectors from home visiting to child health care to engaging the faith community to mobilizing the senior citizen community and, all, and the elevation of public messaging all around building a relational frame across the whole community sector. We're advancing the principles of early relational health, which we were, which are captured in the next two slide um, um, that are all visible here. I'll read through them that when we think about a framing of early relational health, it's based upon the importance of foundational relationships from birth. It arises from listening to families, communities, and the cultural stories that talk of resiliency and strength. It's essential for building future health, early learning, social emotional well-being of the child. It's science-based, strength-based, and family-centric. It really reflects, this framework reflects the bi-directional delight of parents, extended family, and caregivers in their developing relationships with their young children um, and themselves. It's grounded in a frame of human dignity and opposing the, the, the systemic racism. It acknowledges the overload, of course, and negative context of poverty and racism is foundational to the positive experiences that address equity, recovery, resiliency, and protection. But it's not a program nor a specific intervention, but an all-in approach that partners with communities and works with successful programs and thereby a paradigm shift um, in this work. So what are some of the takeaways other than I hope you're inspired to bring foundation relationship, early relational frame to all of your good work in uh, on the strengthening families effort, but evermore are there tips that you can bring to families themselves? 
For example, it's really important that we reach out consistently, particularly relationally. And you're, we're witnessing that at so many levels of our community that's being elevated. Always inquire about the parents' feeling about their relationships with their young children. Let's not be afraid to ask, how's it going? What are you experiencing? What are you learning about you there? What are you seeing? Encourage parents to connect with someone at least daily for that social networking. Like we say, um, um, a single mother with a baby alone is you know, an emergency. The social connections are critical to the support of families, young women, fathers in the care of their children. That, that infectious nature of the support has tremendous power. Routines really matter. Um, we mused about toddlers um, really need a lot more connect connection that we need. And some have discovered that if you give 30 hugs a day, you get a little time for a little bit of their self-play because they feel more secure. Uh, reading together is essential as those moments that are not only brave building and, joy and, and literacy promoting, but those are those moments relationally that really help create strengthening and resiliency. And one of the biggest research questions is just how much deeply connected emotional connection is required in order to build well-being. And it may be less than we think, but does require the intentionality of those key moments of time. We all know that for infants and toddlers, it is all in. And let's be explicit about that. Hence the challenges that go on for those dear young families that are trying to work full time home with infants and toddlers. But most of all, reflectively, all parents have good and bad days. We've got to be kind to ourselves in that efforts. But we all can remember the power and criticalness of human relationships. Even one human relationship can help us weather adversity and protect our youngest from harm. The power of human relationships comes from simple and ordinary interactions day by day. We do not need to be perfect in every human interaction to be helpful. These actually came from our colleagues at the Fred Rogers Center, that thinking from Fred Rogers about the simple messages of relationships and how critical those are. And even yesterday, I read from our colleagues of the National Indian Child Welfare Association, a comment that's jumped out to me, that at the, in this moment of COVID and sheltering place in the virtual environment, although we are apart, we're still together, much like what's happening even here in our dialogue with one another. The other thing not to lose sight of is the fact that even under adversity, most have find the resiliency and do well. And it is those relational supports that and the strengthening family protective factors that we deeply know about that can assure even under these great moments of challenge, the opportunity in front of us. So in closing, um, let's really put our mind together about how we can begin to build ever further from what we know of our protective factors work, what we know about the essential nature of foundational relationships, what the science is really calling us to move and carry forward and message. And how do we use this moment in time, not as a crisis to be wasted, but a huge opportunity to advance our good work with a relational frame to build the future well-being of um, this nation um, from our knowledge base and from our leadership. So uh, thank you, Kaylin, for this opportunity to share with the network about this thinking. And can I turn it back to you now for uh, opening up a discussion for questions, answers, and comments? Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, David. Um, really compelling uh, content and, and I think we're all looking for this kind of information. So um, we've had a number of people asking about uh, sharing the slides. I also have to apologize because in the, the laws of how it works when you're working from home and doing virtual meetings, the lawn mowers arrived right as it was time for me to start talking again. But um, we were muted while the elementary school teachers did a parade <laughs> of cars honking horns outside my window, um, which was another reminder of the importance of relational health um, in schools for older kids. So I apologize for any background noise. Um, uh, please, I encourage people to type in questions that you have in the Q&A box. We have one there already, which I'll read in a moment. And um, 
just want to make sure that everyone knows the slides are actually already posted at the link that I put in the box. Thank you, Lucretia, for getting those up there so quickly. Uh, lots of people are looking for those slides. David, I always take that as a good sign. <laughs> people want, want to hold on to this information and share it with others. So um, I'll read the question that was already typed in by Sarah Brock and others. Feel free to type in your questions as we go or raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted. So here comes the question. Where can I get information on the specific goals around promoting foundational relationships as a new framework that CSSP is implementing? What will it accomplish that other frameworks don't or aren't? I love it, but want to know what is expected from a paradigm shift, shifting from what to what? Those are incredibly complicated questions that we're discerning as we speak with multiple teams of people. That's exactly central to um, what our work is about at CSSP and with our National Early Relational Health Advisory Panel, as well as with our teams in our EC-Link um, Action Learning Lab. I would say that since we have, a, we know from not only the National Survey of Children's Health, but in so many states um, that have kindergarten readiness assessments, um, the number of young children that come to school with weak social emotional skills or kindergarten readiness skills, that we have a population based target. And we know that relationships matter and that the drivers that have um, development end up off point, we can observe and we can discover and we can create supports and take action. Blending the efforts of our knowledge to changing action in our delivery systems is what's staring in front of us. For example, in the medical homes, there's a lot of movement now for, well, there's all the ACE screening work, which also includes a promotion element to that effort, meaning calling out the promotion of strong relationships in face of adversity. I'm aware of clinics in, the, in California and now in the Oregon landscape where there's ACE screening and uh, promotion efforts simultaneously going on um, at a population level to strengthen the relationships intentionally um, as one part. Secondly, there is work going on about, say, maternal depression screening, referral, and follow-up that includes then an intentional focus on what's the social-emotional status of a young child whose family is struggling with depression. That generates then action points similarly. I think there's a lot here to be worked out. When one absorbs the focus is not just child development alone, but the relational drivers of how child development outcomes come as a result of relational experiences and context, there's a wide open space for us all to put our minds together to figure out what are the best measured benefits of change? What are the key elements that are in place that are most meaningful? Yet there's a lot here to needs partnership and leadership from others that can help us think through the best action points. This is a co-development strategy. This is a co-discovery strategy. Um, but one, when one shifts from a focus on the individual to a focus dyadically, the world looks different. And then you start making decisions and what you measure and what you do and what you invest in, in a relational sense. So join us in that discovery process. Thank you. And I think when you just said that shift from focusing on the child alone to focusing on the dyadic relationship, that's the paradigm shift that we can see in all kinds of fields. And I think particularly in healthcare, um, in pediatric uh, health, child health systems, um, but in a lot of the other um, systems that we engage with as well. Um, we have a couple other questions that are in. I'll also share that several people typed into the chat box where they're planning to share this information with other professionals, with parents. Um, so that's really heartening. Um, all right, we've got a question. Um, this is from Angie Bruning, who says, thank you, David, important work that's worth doing. Our future depends on it. Is relational health offered as a program of study in four-year colleges? And I'll say yet. <laughs> <laughs> I would say no, but I would also say there's growing interest. Um, um, the materials are there. They've not necessarily been brought deeply into training uh, networks. I am aware. Imagine if we had an initiative around community colleges, around those that actually provide the care 
in communities and services locally. I'm aware of one community college in Washington State that actually is building out an infant mental health uh, certificate program in the community college for training. And perhaps um, we could think together as to how do we test that and make it more visible. And then those of you that actually have impact, have influence to curricula in university training settings, um, help us figure that out. Thank you. All right, we've got another question um, from Linda Block asking um, about parents who have lost custody of their children. So she writes, when parents have lost custody and hear about the importance of early attachment and relationships, it contributes to their suffering about having lost custody. Where do they find hope? Can parents step back in and bond and how much time apart is too much? It's never too much. And there's always hope and resiliency in relationships when they're authentic. And um, we know that out of, you know, some of the, out of the treatment literature. Secondly, your question, Linda, makes me think immediately of an anti-racist st stance as to the number of, um, um, the lack of supports as opposed to the protections that are really essential to, um, and the, the racist issues that disrupt and contribute to those parents that actually do lose custody where we could do much better in a protective and a promoting and a supporting set stance. I am aware that there are leaders in the child welfare community that are deeply interested in a relational health frame and it will require an anti-racist frame. And if one begins to put those elements together, like we have in some of our safe baby court effort, like we have in the opportunity of family first, like we have um, in terms of really people thinking about how do we get deep into pre prevention, promotion, and safety together, I think there's huge opportunity to break what I think is a travesty in the way that some of our current policies operate. So Linda, um, it, it brings great um, pain to me because I know I've been with families in my clinical work of years as to this struggle. But I also see if we take a relational health frame into with our child welfare communities and our leaders, we may be able to make the kind of changes necessary for not only, of course, protection, but also the prevention promotion efforts that are really essential to families that are struggling. Thank you so much. Um, I also hope that um, this focus on relational health will push systems to find ways to better facilitate maintaining those connections um, when when children are um, in out-of-home custody. Uh, that, you know, understanding the importance, now understanding the importance of attachment hasn't always gotten us there, but um, with this focus on very concrete things that parents can do, maybe there's more role modeling and facilitated interactions that can happen um, during that time when uh, reunification is the goal. Um, we have a couple other questions here and we're getting close to the end of our time, but we've got a couple minutes. So um, we do have a question from Teresa Martin asking, what resources can you recommend for social emotional learning for young children? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can answer that directly. There are a number of resources um, through the EC Connector and others that could answer that. Um, Kaylin, do you have any thoughts? I actually don't feel like I'm up on what the what the latest um, you know tools are for that direct teaching in the classroom, um, you know, in a preschool setting. Um, yeah, I'm I'm afraid to say I don't know. And yet, I know there are resources we could look we could search those out. I I, I can't pull them out of my mind, but I have them in my inboxes in places so we can <laughs> try to make those right. available. Okay. And uh, Rachel Gilgoff typed Rachel in. Rachel just, thank uh, you Rachel. Yes. Castle is a good organization for social emotional learning. That's the. Exactly. Thank you. I'm going to forget what it stands for so I'll just say the acronym C-A-S-E-L. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, that's actually the end of the questions that have been typed in. Um, we got to everything right as the time was wrapping up. Um, Martha also, Martha Reader mentioned that CCEFL, um, and I know that one, the Center for the Social Emotional Foundations of Early Learning, 
um, that one has a lot of good resources as well. Um, so um, thanks everyone for contributing. Um, thank you, David, for this great presentation. It's really wonderful to bring this to our Strengthening Families Network and we will be continuing this conversation as we go. So if you have been listening today and you've got ideas about how this connects to your work, please uh, just send us an email. Um, everybody has my email, I think, and I can forward to David um, and his contact information was shared on the slides as well. So if you download those slides, uh, which are posted now at the Alliance's site, you can grab them there. So thanks everyone for joining us. This has been a great conversation and we look forward to connecting again soon. Take so care, much. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.